Thank you so much for joining us for this special UCL Lunch Hour Lecture to mark Holocaust Memorial Day. Well, look, the, the enormity of the Holocaust, both in terms of the suffering entailed and, and the scale of the event, often makes it hard for our imaginations to grasp. And in that context, it's incredibly important to hear the first-hand testimony of survivors. And I know that's very important to the work of the UCL Holocaust Education um, Program as, as they go into school, helping the next generation to think about this extraordinary landmark event in European history. And we're very lucky to have with us today Marla Tribuk, a um, survivor of the Holocaust, to talk about her experience. Um, and then I'll have the opportunity to talk to Ruth Ann Lenger from the Holocaust Education Program about some of the ways in which that work in school is going on. Um, Marla, it's incredibly kind and very brave of you to um, be willing to share your story with us today. I, I wonder if you could just start by telling us something about what life was like before the Nazis for you and your family. Um, well, I was born in a town uh, called Piotrkov in Poland. And life then was very pleasant. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as sophisticated as today, but um, I went to school. I had friends. We had a lovely park. We went, our holidays tended to be not by the sea. We had lots of forests and resorts, but uh, we were quite a long way from the sea. There's mm -hmm. only a little bit facing in Poland. And um, it was really uneventful. I was the middle one of three children. Yes. Uh, with an older brother, Ben, and the younger sister, Lucia. And we really all did our own thing. We had our own friends. And um, our parents... Um, well, my father was always busy, but my mother was the one that looked after us full time. Mm. She didn't work, which I think was the way in those mm -hmm. days. People who had children didn't work. And um, it was really lovely. And then on the 9th, on the 1st of September 1939, yes. it all change. And, and how old were you when life changed? I was still kind of eight. I was approaching nine, but mm. I was effectively eight before, uh, when the war broke out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so can you tell us something about what, what happened initially? Yeah. Well, it started with bombing. Mm -hmm. And I know that we, we went into shelter, not shelters, into the basement. We lived in a block of flats. Most people in town, there were only flats, not houses. And um, it was all, I remember a wounded man coming through. Mm -hmm. And um, it was all very frightening. Yes. But. Quite frankly, it didn't make that much of an impression because it didn't last. Mm -hmm. Within five days, they had in invaded yes. our town. And within two weeks, they had invaded the whole of Poland. Wow. Poland was completely unprepared for this. Wow. And so then, within a few months, a part of your town was turned into a, a, a ghetto. Actually, it was much faster than that. Oh, wow. It was the first ghetto in Europe, huh. in our house, in our town, and it um, started on the first of November. Within two months of the war, wow. we had already been driven out of our homes into ghetto walls. Mm. And 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 what was life like in the ghetto for you now, in those? Ghetto, it's really a subject of its own because. Sure. Um, we actually had a Jewish administration within the ghetto. Yes. And we had all the sort of ranks, like we, we had the police mm -hmm. who had the one star, two stars, three stars, right. buttons, and it was done in a very formal way. Mm. We also had a president. <clears throat> We had a Jewish administration, and that sounds as if that was fine because we were independent, sure. but it wasn't like that. Yes. We, 
well, I remember being terribly frightened, and I think even the adults were, yes. because, first of all, they were patrolling our ghetto all the time. Mm -hmm. We're only allowed out, well, during the day we're allowed out, but by 8 o'clock we had to be, or it could have been 7, I don't remember the precise time. Uh, we had to be back in our homes. Mm -hmm. There was great overcrowding. Um, there were 15,000 Jews living in that town. 15,000? 15, 15,000 out of 55,000. Right. And, um, but there was a big influx from outside because um, the Germans annexed quite a lump of Poland that in near us because yes. we were on the German side, near the German border. And um, the ghetto, well, the ghetto got smaller. Yes. And um, people who lived in, the, in that area had to quickly flee yes. to, into the ghetto. They could by then go into other ghettos as well. But ours was a very large ghetto in mm. Poland and people from all around came. Mm. We had, um, out of the 15,000, apart from the 15,000, um, we had people from outside because at its height, the ghetto had 28,000 people. Wow. And the of overcrowding was terrible. Yes, yes. There were as many as, there could be as many as 10 people to a room. Mm. It would be a very large room, but even so. And, and how did the community keep going in that context? You know, was well, that a... It, you know, the community was actually very caring. Yes. And they made sure that nobody really starved because we had rations, food was hard to get. Yes. At the beginning, people still had some money, although they asked to hand it in. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, pe people managed, but as time went on, yes. they used up their money. They were still, it was in a way a microcosm of what was a normal time before. Sure. There were the people who were better off than other people. Yes, yes. But we had the soup kitchen. Mm -hmm. We had help for people. Yes who uh, were very hard up. Yes. So there was still, you know, we kept up a certain sort of level of, of life. Normal, a, a sort of yeah. normal life, with yeah. inverted commas. Uh, but and, at the same time, we did suffer a lot from the patrolling of soldiers course. and they were shooting people and so on. Mm. So, so this odd combination during that period of real terror, real fear, mm. but also at the same time a commitment in the community to keep things going, and presumably particularly for young people like you. Huh? Yes, there wasn't a lot for us young people to do right. because school stopped immediately and right. we're not allowed to have classes inside. We, were caught. Oh, wow. we could be caught because it was illegal. Mm. They didn't want us to learn. and. Um, there was one particular German officer. I didn't know his name, but I can't think of it at the moment. He used to turn up with a big black dog. Huh. And that dog was actually trained to attack people oh, wow. in a certain way, particularly men. It was quite horrifying. Huh. And I know that if he was seen, from a distance, everybody immediately disappeared off the streets, wow. adults as well as children. So, so horrendous as, as that all sounds, um, things got even worse in 1942, well, didn't they? Well, they were getting what? worse all the time. Right. And in 1942, there were rumours that there's going to be a deportation. Mm -hmm. And it is going to be to Treblinka. Now, that was not a labor camp, mm -hmm. that was a death camp. There yes. were a few of them. And um, people arrived there, and within a few hours, they were dead. Wow. And 
you know, there, there was such fear of what was going to happen. People tried to save their lives. Yes. But there weren't many possibilities. One of them was that one could escape from the ghetto and mm -hmm. live outside uh, in the forest, in the sewers. Mm -hmm. Or they could judge, some had, people had friends outside, Christian friends who would hide one or two members of the family. And there was also, there were also some people who would hide Jews for money. Right. And my father was, inter um, was introduced, my father together with my uncle, Joseph Klein, my mother's uh, brother. Mm -hmm. They were introduced to a man who had come from another town called Tenstohova. Mm -hmm. And he was not only Christian, but he was also partly German, mm -hmm. which gave him a lot of, it gave him more privileges than anybody else right. had. And this man was willing to, um, to hire two girls. And he came to Piotrkov to um, discuss it with my father and uncle. And it was decided that, and this was for money, of sure. course. It was decided that um, we'll both go to Chernstohova one at a time a week apart because it was too dangerous to have Jew, uh, Jewish children traveling. Mm -hmm. Although we were on false papers and we had fair hair and blue eyes, mm -hmm. it still wasn't safe to be exposed to traveling on one's own. So um, he said he came to discuss conditions and uh, be paid in advance. Yes. And um, then the rest followed. He came a week later to collect me, uh, and the week after that to collect my, my cousin Ija. Mm -hmm. And we both found ourselves in this ha house on the outskirts of Chernstohova. And the people, a middle-aged couple, they were this man's um, parents-in-law. He lived around the corner with his um, wife right. and child. And there we were, terribly scared. And we were supposed to be relatives that had come to stay from Piotrkov. We were on false papers. And we had to memorize all this. Yes. Sometimes when there was a knock on the door, it was okay to mix. Other times they quickly got rid of us under the bed, into a cupboard, anywhere out of sight. Yes. So, um, so always um, scared. Yes. Uh, we didn't feel that it, we were safe. And my cousin, Ija, who was an only child, mm -hmm. I was one of three. Um, she was so homesick, she couldn't bear it. Yes. And she asked to be taken home. Yes. And the man said you, she couldn't go home yet because the deportations are still yes. going on. But she said that her parents have very good friends in Piotrkov. They are um, um, hiding her parents' valuables mm -hmm. and they'll take her in. And the men said, OK. Off they went. I thought she was so lucky to yes. be with her parents. And I was still languishing there for a long time and I won't go into details what happened in between. But eventually the time came for me to go home. Mm -hmm. The deportations were finished. And we traveled to Piotrkov. We um, went to where my father was working mm -hmm. in a flour mill, which before the war belonged to him. Now yes. he was lucky to have a job there. Yes. Well, he, it would belong to him in partnership with his brother and one other man. It was quite a big, very nice mill. And um, we went to the top floor. There was my father sitting there waiting for me. But also my uncle, Joseph Klein, Ija's father. Yes. He looked at us and he went white. He said, where's my daughter? 
And the man said, I brought her back. I took her to your friends. And my mm. uncle said, but she's not there. Where is she? What have you done with my child? Yes. And that's the end of the story. She was never seen again. We have no idea what happened to her. Wow. It was the most tragic thing. Yes. And um, my uncle was arrested. My uncle, that was my mother's side of the family. She yes. was a client, so there were... She had two brothers in our town, mm -hmm. and they were all in the flower business, strangely yes. enough. They also had a flower mill in partnership. And um, my, I'm sorry, I lost my trend. <laughs> but, um, so, and I had, two, so there were two, Cl Klein is mm -hmm. the name yes. of my two uncles. My father was a health god, mm -hmm. and there was, and he had a brother. So that there were two Klein brothers and two health god brothers, mm -hmm. and of course the people in hiding, my cousin and I. I was a health god; she yes. was a Klein. Yes. And I don't know the full story of this, but it's probably they didn't know which Klein would be responsible for hide, having us hidden. I don't know, there's much more to it than I know. Yes. But they arrested both health gods, both clients, and some more people as well. Hmm. They kept them in jail, and after a little while, they were released. They were not released. They were marched to the Jewish cemetery. They hmm. were lined up against the wall mm. and shot. Mm. So my aunt lost her daughter and her son mm. within a very short space of time. She survived the war. And when we met after the war, well, she she was liberated in, in Bergen-Belsen. And her first priority was to travel back to Tjotkov or, or Chernstohova to see what happened. Yes. To Egypt. But, um, well, she got back, but the man had gone. He fled. Yes. And there was nothing. Nowhere. And how, how did the authorities know about the decision to hide you once you'd been brought back? How, how was it all revealed? Now, yes, that, that's, um, that's a good question. Because... <laughs> um, when we came back, the ghetto had been reduced to, uh, originally the ghetto had 28,000 in it, but we were only 15,000 yes. Jews in that country, in that town. So the reason for the, for, for the numbers was that they came from other towns and it became terribly overcrowded. And because of the overcrowding, there were a lot of epidemics. Yes. And 4,000 died of epidemics. Wow. And at deportation, there were 24,000. Mm. And they were all deported except uh, for 2,200, mm. mostly men, because they were going to be used for the two factories where it was going to, was going to become a labor camp. Mm. So now, um, uh, the the so, so the Nazi guards then um, had purged the Jews who'd managed to avoid um, uh, deportation, and 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 that was also the last time, as I understand it, that that you saw your mother and sister. Um, with that no, actually, that wasn't the last time. Right. Because um, my. Family, when I got back into the ghetto, it was a very poor site. They had reduced the ghetto to two half streets, not two and a half, but two half streets. And there were 2,200 people. They had worked it out that 1,100 for each factory where they were going to be employed. Right. Most of them were actually employed. Mm -hmm. But now it was going to be turned into a labor camp mm. and they would be living there. Yes. So 
a lot of people were returning. When I returned into the ghetto, I found my family intact. Right. My, I was smuggled in with the men, but they knew this was going on, and they turned a blind eye. Right. Because they knew people had been in hiding, so yes. they just kept quiet. And when I got back, it's, well, I found out that my brother had a labor pay, permit, mm -hmm. labor card, um, and my father, mother, and sister were uh, hidden by friends, Polish friends, but each one in a different house. Right. So they'd also uh, and been... I returned, and we were intact, right. but that was very unusual. Most yes. people had been deported, and some died, and uh, it was a terrible... I had never witnessed the proper um, deportation because I wasn't part of it. Yes. I was away, but from what I have seen and read, it's. Uh, I did witness one small one, very mm. small one, I was part of it. So I'll, I'll just, it's just leading up to it because when they thought all the people in hiding mm -hmm. had returned, they didn't know, but um, they knew that they were returning. Um, but when they thought they were all there, they started rounding them up. Mm -hmm. And on one occasion, they broke into a room where I was with my mother and sister. Mm -hmm. And I was in bed. The room was quite full. There were a lot of people there. We were all illegal because the workers were at work. Um, and they took everybody away except me because my mother said I wasn't well. I was in bed. Right. And the policeman said, that's all right, you can stay. Now, that is so unusual. Yes. It was extraordinary. And that's how I survived that bit. Mm. But the people, the, well, as my mother was leaving, she said, you know, when dad comes home, tell him what happened. Mm. And um, so there were now only three of us left. Mm -hmm. And very quickly, I can tell you what happened to all these people that they rounded up gradually. Yes. Uh, they rounded up 560 altogether. Mm -hmm. And um, they kept them in, in the synagogue, mm -hmm. which was very dilapidated. Yes. It had been used as stables and it had been partially bombed. Conditions were dreadful, but yes. that's where they were kept. And they were adding more and more people. And then on the 20th of um, December, 1942, they walked them out in groups of 50 mm -hmm. to the local forest called Rakov. Yes. And the first group found their communal grave ready waiting for them mm. and others followed and well they were killed in the most horrific way mm. those were the killings that were going on all over Europe yes um, and the biggest one was actually in Kiev where they killed over 300 uh, 3,000 people yes in, in Piotrkov, it was 560. I know that from the records. And I never describe any of it because of it's, it's too painful. It was carried out by the Einsatzgruppen yes. or the 101 Battalion. Mm -hmm. There's a lot written about it because they have sort of tried, people have tried to understand how the people who are carrying this out. They were ordinary people. Yes. And there's actually a book called that, as I said it, I remembered, Ordinary People. I can't remember. Ordinary the... Men. Yeah. Hmm? Yes. Ordinary Men, yes. Yeah. Mm. And... Um, and that, of course, is a, 
part of the reason why the work of programs like the Holocaust Education Center is so important isn't it? because just as yeah. we hear your story to 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 make these horrific things real oh. we've got to all be asking ourselves the question how does it happen you know what 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 what's in our hearts that makes this possible yes. for ordinary yes. people to be involved in indeed mm. Absolutely. So, um, so, so, but I'm sorry, I, I, I interrupted you. No, so, no, so you were in bed, and presumably your father and your brother came home, and 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 you had the and terrible job of telling him what was me. happening. Yeah, mm. to tell him, but of course they it spread very quickly. People knew who went, who yes. when, and how. And, um, but yes, these Einsatzgruppen, 101 Battalion, these two. There's a lot written about them mm. because they were going into the psychology mm. of these people who are doing the killings mm. because they were ordinary people. And yes, and that's why it reminds the book is called Ordinary People. Yes. They said what made them, they could have had other jobs. Yes, yes. But, um, and they also describe how it wasn't easy for them to do it. But, um, well, if anyone is interested, obviously, mm. they, they can read the book. There are a few books on it. Mm. And um, so now I was, I only had my father mm. and brother. There were three of us. But they were always rounding people up. We never knew when it might happen again. And on one occasion, they rounded up an aunt of mine, a health got aunt, mm -hmm. my father's side of the family. Mm -hmm. And she was taken away screaming, who will look after my child? Mm. And by then, I was the only female health got member of yes. the family yes. left. My cousin Anne was five and I was 12 yes. at that time. And I looked after her. Mm. Mm. And did she also survive the war? She did miraculously survive, yes. yes. She was very small and, and, and she was very frightened. Yes. And she, she became so attached to me, she was terrified of losing me. Yeah, of course. But she survived. <coughs> Marla, I think it's fair to say she survived because of you. Well, I did my best. Why don't you tell us, um, Ruth Ann, something about you? Know, I mean, listening to Mala's story <coughs> is just it, extraordinary in so many ways. I, I wonder if you could tell us something about um, what happens in a classroom when um, young people hear these stories for the first time. It's quite incredible. Mm. I mean, we're all absorbed completely <coughs> in Mala and following her story and uh, it's the same with young people mm. and teachers tell us that the, what they consider the most unlikely of student is absolutely absorbed you can't hear a pin drop and they have invested their emotion into into the journey that uh, Marlo other survivors take them on mm. And, and I also think there is something remarkable about the fact that survivors such as Marla are prepared mm, to open yes. their heart to strangers, a different generation, to young people, and to share the most disturbing memory they mm. have. I mean, it's an incredible generosity uh, and selflessness on, on behalf of, of the survivor. Mm. To do mm. that, it isn't easy. And I think it's something about that that the student grasps, that there is a trust going on between yes. the survivor opening their heart and mm -hmm. the student, and, and a sense of that student is worthy enough to hear this intimate, deeply disturbing story. And so many of our students in our classrooms come with their own pain mm, and mm. their own traumas. And, and sometimes you feel, and certainly the discussions that happen afterwards, there are times where you feel they relate 
not to the experience, of course, but to the pain mm. Mm. and to the suffering. Mm. And there's something absolutely incredible about that. And of course, it's again, it's now a very rare experience mm. to come face to face and hear from a survivor directly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why we've been crazily recording and uh, UCL uh, has recorded uh, Marla as well, mm, mm. Uh, talk especially about her liberation, which I hope you'll get to at, at Bergen-Belsen. Mm. But perhaps if, if Marla's <laughs> recovered, I would very much like her to tell this particular element of the story when time had run out for Marla's luck. Yes. And it was the moment uh, they had gathered up all the remnants, the elderly, the pregnant women, the women with young children, little girls, little, you know, anyone. And Marla found herself, and I'll let you continue, in a column to be deported. The lorries were, were all lined and the column was getting shorter and shorter and shorter. It was a brutal deportation. The woman in front of Marla had been was carrying a baby and must have stepped out of line and was beaten over the head. It was a brutal scene with dogs and guards and Marla's time to be deported was approaching, except Marla, <laughs> being Marla, at 12 years of age, suddenly decided to take an audacious step would you like to tell us what you did, Marla, <laughs> which I find incredible? Uh, I find it incredible. Well, I don't know how I did it. Mm. I really don't know. People say, so how could you do that? But um, I don't know. I looked to my right and I saw this German officer. Yes. He was obviously in charge, although he, he was not doing anything. Yes. He was just watching. And... Um, I, s I stepped out of the column, and I could have been shot for that, but mm. this room would be nobody. There's so much commotion, no one noticed it. I went up to him and I said that I have um, been separated from my father and brother. They're inside the ghetto. Yes. Um, can I go back to them? Then he looked very surprised, slightly amused, I think. I don't know what was in his thought, and maybe he had a 12-year-old at home. Yes. But he called over a Jewish policeman and said, take her back into the ghetto. Wow. But on the way, I said, just a minute, I've got to get my cousin. And he said, you can't take her because she hasn't had permission. So I was in this situation. What do I do? Yes. Do I choose my, my father and brother or do I choose my cousin? I felt I couldn't abandon her. Yes. But I, I didn't want the, to be separated from my father and brother. It was a terrible dilemma. I bet it was. And it... And at that point, I, I usually say, and that's a fact, people, if they read books, they'll come across these situations, where they, you know, they were giving people dilemmas like, well, you've got two children, you can keep one. Yes. Which one yes. will you give up? I mean, there's nothing worse to, to, no. to make a decision. I mean, psychologically, emotionally, it's just too terrible yes. for words. But anyway, I found myself in this position and I somehow kept on saying and asking and pleading. And eventually he said, OK, quickly take and, take and go inside the gate. Mm. Because officially he wasn't supposed to let anyone else go. Yes. But anyway, the two of us were back. And it was in a day or two, those... 2,200 people were divided into 1,100 for each factory. Mm. One was a glass, I don't know if I mentioned that, one was a glass factory and yes. the other was the plywood. And we were allotted to the plywood one. At um, that time, at the age of 12, I became a slave labourer. Yes. And didn't work. I mean, she was really a very young child and yes. she was very frail. 
Um, and she couldn't let me out of her sight, but she knew I had to go to work. Yes. But because we worked shifts, there were, there were always some women who would um, keep an eye on her. Yes. And we were there about, and of course the barracks for the men were at the other end of this enormous compound. Yes. Uh, and the men were over here, and um, but we used to see one another mm -hmm. sometimes in the factory and other times in the grounds. So we were still there for about 18 months, a bit more than 18 months, mm -hmm. when they decided to deport us. So they marched us, women separately from men, mm -hmm. to the railway station, and the cattle trucks were waiting for us. Mm -hmm. Um, we got on and we went on it. We didn't know where we were going. I can tell you now that the men were sent to Buchenwald concentration camp. Mm -hmm. And the, and we, I was the women, we ended up in Ravensbrück concentration mm -hmm. camp. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard of Ravensbrück. Mm -hmm. it, it is the biggest women's camp in, concentration camp in Germany. Yes. I learned that only recently, after all these years. Um, and um, <clears throat> the first thing they did was to take notes, names. They, they, everything is recorded, and it's actually online, that, that record. Yes. And um, then we had to give everything away we, uh, we brought. It wasn't very much. Few few bits of some of clothing, I think, and um, then we had to undress. They took our clothing away. Um, they shaved our heads. Mm -hmm. We went through cold communal showers. Mm -hmm. We um, and when we got our, our striped jacket and skirt, we looked at one another and we could not recognize each other. Mm. I mean, without the hair and yes. in the, all in the same uniform, it really was, it's difficult to describe what yes. it does to your soul. Yes. To be stripped of your identity, to be and to be just like everybody else, and you don't recognize your own friends. It had a terrible effect on us. I'm sure. And one of the effects was to make us lose hope. Yes. And without hope, you can't survive. Yes. And, um, and people sometimes say to me, so you did have hope. And quite honestly, I did, didn't have hope consciously. Yes. Maybe subconsciously I did. Mm -hmm. And often people say, so, so how did you survive? And I said, well, I've just told you my story. I don't know. Yes. Um, but um, th that was a terrible thing that that journey was four and a half days in these cattle trucks with no food or water well i think they gave us something at some point but i don't remember all the details so when we arrived in ravensbrook oh we've arrived in ravensbrook already so we we you know, people, as I said, the, the, the sort of complete change of being like everybody else, mm. no individuals, um, that did something to people. And losing hope meant that they were dying because yes. in a very short time, my aunt, Franja Klein, died. Mm -hmm. She became ill and died. My best friend, Pema Blachman, became ill and died. Mm -hmm. And if you notice that I give you their names, that wouldn't mean very much. Mm. But I feel very strongly, that's quite recently I've come to this conclusion, that when I know people who perished in the Holocaust, yes. if I know their name, I always mention them by name yes. because most of the names are not known. Mm -hmm. 
and people are just buried, and there was nothing, nobody. Because in some cases, whole families were wiped out. Mm. Mm. There's nobody left to remember them. Mm. And we try to, we, we really, in the Jewish religion, we have a memorial prayers mm -hmm. and all sorts mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. But we don't really know the names. So I lost these two precious people, but more were dying. I didn't necessarily know them. We were there. Now, the women worked. My One of my aunts, the one who survived, she was working in the fields picking vegetables, and one day she brought me a carrot or a turnip, and that was like, like getting gold. Yes. And, um, and she really risked her life yes. because um, the, if you were caught, it really was very dangerous. And that's the aunt who lost Ija. Mm. So um, we were there not very long. I, I didn't work. Well, my cousin obviously didn't, but I wasn't that big at the age of, well, by then I was 30, uh, 14. Um, so we were there about three months when they got us onto trains again. Yes. And this time, after a short journey, well, much shorter than the other one, we found ourselves in Bergen-Belsen. Mm -hmm. And there's no station at Bergen-Belsen, but we um, we got off at some point and walked to the to the camp. When we arrived, there was no room for us, mm -hmm. so they put us up in a very big tent overnight. And in the morning, we went into the camp. Mm -hmm. And I'll just do a very short description of what faced you when you walked in. And the first thing that hit you was the smog and the smell. Mm -hmm. And there were people there, but there were skeletons. And they were sort of shuffling along like zombies. Mm. And as they were shuffling, they would collapse and die. Hmm. And there were dead bodies everywhere and piles of bodies and piles of twisted, decaying corpses. Hmm. It was a horrific sight. Yes, I'm sure it was. And um, that's what the British Army faced when they yes. got there. And. I, on the way, wherever they were taking us, I heard that there is a children's home somewhere in the camp. And I quickly changed direction with my little cousin We went to find it. Mm. And um, we were interviewed by two women, Dr. Bimko and Sister Luba. They were quite well known. Sister Luba uh, was, well, we called her Sister Luba, but Dr. Bimko worked in the hospital and knew she knew the commandant of the camp, Kramer. And so she had some influence, and she's the one who was able to establish this home for the children, mm -hmm. it was mostly Dutch children. And um, even in that slightly better situations, slightly better conditions, still very short of food. Um, I succumbed to, uh, to typhus, mm -hmm. and typhus was raging and all sorts of diseases. And I remember lying on my upper bunk by mm -hmm. the window. I must have come back into consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing people running. And and I, I have that, you know, I, I, that scene. Yes. I, I've never forgotten it because one of them was a little boy. And I didn't know why they were running or where they were running. But all I could think of, how have they got the strength to run? I said, because... Um, 
typhus is so debilitating, yes. you can't move, you can't move a muscle. Mm. And that was the 15th of April, 1945, mm. when we were liberated by the British Army. Yes. So that's really one end of, and then another story begins. So another story does begin. And I, I wonder if you could um, tell us something about um, the next phase and in particular about your, um, did, uh, did you then um, go to Britain? Um, and, 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 and how do you begin to put together a life after an experience like that as a young person? Well, I should imagine that for older people, I was then 14, mm. I wasn't an adult, so other people were looking after me. They were making decisions for me. Yes. So um, I was, um, Sweden was very generous. They opened their, their gates to mm. anybody who wanted to come in from the camp or, or others. And um, we were sent to Sweden four months after liberation. Mm -hmm. uh, by then I had recovered and the others that. And with us was actually one friend who had Oh, so some lung lung problems that she acquired in Wilson. And she, so she didn't go with us into where we were going. She went into a sanatorium. And she was there for a year. We were corresponding. She's a lovely friend of mine. And she was so witty and clever. And a whole year she was there and she still died in the end. Mm. People were beyond saving. Yes. Um, so I went to Sweden, but I must abbreviate it very much. It was summer, and at first they kept us in sort of resort places, where like summer holiday camps and things, and by the lakes, and. Um, when school season started, we were transferred to a school, but that was a school for survivors. It wasn't, yes. you know, the um, Swedish school. Um, and we were all there, still different languages, because some came from Hungary, yes. some from Germany, and, and I was from Poland. But we all managed, and we were all learning, mm. and we were and, all And was your cousin there active. with you at the, at the time? No, that's, that's a good point you've made, because he, when we were liberated, she was half my age. Yes. I, I was 12 when she was eight. Yes. Uh, tw uh, six. Is it six? So you were 14, maybe? I was 14, she... yes. sorry. Oh, yeah. And she was seven. Yes. So... Um, they wouldn't put a seven-year-old with a 14-year-old sure. in a school. Yes. So she went with the younger children somewhere else. But it's surprising how she... <coughs> she was so scared during the war of leaving me. She had... Uh, she, she held on to me all the time. But after the war, she shed that fear so quickly. Hmm. It, it, you know, psychologically, you, you sort of, you can see what that war did, not only physically, but psychologically yes. to children. Yes. <coughs> so she was with young children, but she was fine. We actually were corresponding. She right. was in a different place. And um, Also in Sweden or in a different country? No, it's Sweden. Yes. And then one day somebody contacted me through somewhere else so he was able to find out where I was because he had some, someone in Israel who had a lot of um, photographs of, of a group of children, mm. which included my cousin. Mm. And so he wanted to see where I am so he could share them with me. And uh, <clears throat> we, we, it all happened, we were put together. And he sent me the photographs. We met her subsequently. But I studied those photographs to see 
is she really okay? Because she had separated from me. She had no mother at all. She had my, me as a substitute, at least, yes. but now nobody. And she, you know, she looked really happy and fine with other children. Mm. Mm. Once war was over, she wasn't so frightened. Mm. And may I ask, um, in all of this, um, the last we heard of your father and your brother, they were working in the plywood factory. Um, what, what was their story after that time? Well, my, my, fa my brother survived and he came to England. Right. With the boys, I don't know if you've heard of the boys, mm -hmm. Windermere boys, yes. rather. Yeah, there's a film, it's online. Yes. And um, he came here and ultimately he, he found me. He mm. discovered where I was and we were corresponding. And I remember those marvelous letters and he, um, and it was decided they were brought over by an organization called the Central British Fund, a Jewish organization, mm. because people were not, although they got permission to come in, they weren't going to, it wasn't going to be at, at the expense of this, of England. Mm. And also each person, each child had to be guaranteed by someone in England. I find my guarantor, after 50 years, I found out who he was mm. because they released the information. But of course, there's no That's chance right. that he'd still be alive. And um, so... Uh, so you were going to tell us about your father. Yeah, yeah, well, I didn't know what happened to my father at the time. My brother only learned much later Mm. And my brother, uh, my father was on a death march mm. and um, he tried to escape mm. with some other people mm. and they were all gunned down mm. and it was just before the end of the war. Mm. Mm. So you were in Sweden. Yeah. Your brother was in England. Yeah. You were eventually reconciled the two of you. Um, when did that happen? Yeah, in 1947, right. um, March 47. But actually, I had to wait for a visa. Yes. I wasn't going to be let in just like that. And because today when you hear a lot about that subject and people are coming without visa, but in those days you weren't allowed without, we weren't couldn't come. But I was waiting and then somebody suggested when originally when my brother came, they um, gave permission for a thousand children to come. Mm. But only 720 came. They couldn't find a thousand children. And somebody had this bright idea of saying, well, what about all those visas? Couldn't we use one of those for Marla? Yes. <laughs> and that's how it happened quicker than it would have. We were corresponding anyway, and um, had some lovely letters from Ben. Mm. And um, when I came, he came to meet me. I came by boat. Mm. I can't remember the name of the place now where I arrived, but Subsequently, I arrived at um, oh, what's that very big uh, London station in just coming towards Liverpool South Street. Waterloo. No, no, <laughs> I can't think of it. Anyway, I arrived at um, it's on the tip of my tongue. It must have been quite some reunion to meet Ben for the first time after everything you had yeah. both gone through. Yeah, it was indeed. Mm. It was. And then as you made a, as you made a life in England, obviously um, people here had been through extraordinary things in the war too, but you, you were a young person who had seen suffering on an 
on an unimaginable scale and of an unimaginable ferocity. Um, how did that transition happen? Did you just want to put it all behind you and get on with life, or um, did you, uh, uh, you know, what, what was that like? That transition for you. And, and did people begin to understand what had happened, or was there still so little information about what had happened that those around you, and particularly those um, British people around you, just couldn't understand it? Well, it's very strange, but I don't, from what I remember, I didn't give it much thought. I think we were all so busy. I joined this group that was already here. But not entirely. I had my own friends, mm. and um, we were. I think we were just so hungry for some life, right? Yes. You know, out of concentration yes. camps, and we couldn't get enough of the, the films and the outings and friends yes. and. Uh, and I know in those days, young people used to go to dances at weekends. Yes. That was a big thing. And although it was there, it's still there now. Yes. You, you never forget anything like that. Yes. But um, we were really just starving for, for a normal life. Yes. And we were getting it. Of course, the, some people fared better than others. Some people mm. had to have a lot of psychological sort of yeah, treatment, care, and um, it, it, it's been all different for different people. Mm. I think a lot depended on on the partners that they eventually found. The youngsters, oh, yes. and you found a great one. You found a real special yes. boy, didn't mm. you? And within a few years. You married him. A few years. A um, couple of years. <laughs> you were 20, were you, when you got married? I was 19. Oh. <laughs> well, I was sort of getting on for 20. I was uh, not far off. But, um, yes, I was very lucky. I keep saying that I was very lucky. I suppose you just have to thank God that for what you have, yes. I mean, it could always, everything could always be better, but I, I married a really wonderful man. Yes. I would say that. I know people say that, but he was a wonderful husband. My husband spent five and a half years in the British Army. Mm. When the army, when the war broke out, he said to his mother, I'm going to enlist. Yes. And she said, don't rush. They'll send for you when they want you. Yes. And he got his calling up papers in 1942 on St. Valentine's Day. Yes. Isn't that romantic? Yeah. <laughs> and, Not uh, his mother. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he served five and a half years in, um, well, he was in some terrible battles. Mm. He, he was lucky to come back alive. And he used to, always say, I arrived in England at the same time as Marla. Yes. Yeah. And, well, you couldn't compare the arrivals. I didn't even know if, if that was so. He always wanted to identify with me. Mm. But you know, when he died and I looked through his wallets and things and he had his paper of, of the, the mob papers sure. yes. and he... And he did arrive the same time as I <laughs> wow. in England from abroad because he was in North Africa and uh, Italy and all various places. Well, what, a, mm. what a wonderful moment of new beginning. Mm. Look, um, uh, Mala, thank you so much. I um, uh, uh, shan't try and summarise our time together with any, uh, a, 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 any trite conclusion because I'm sure a part... Ruth Ann, of what goes on Absolutely. in the classroom yes. is that these stories unfold in their own way as, as people come to understand what human beings are capable of yes. for, for, for good and for, Ill, for yes. survival and for suffering. Um, and it's been a tremendous privilege today, Marla, to hear your story. And thank you so very much for taking the time to, um, to share it with us. We're just very grateful. 
as as we commemorate here at UCL um, this Holocaust Memorial Day, um, and as we celebrate too the work of the Holocaust Education Program, so uh, um, a, 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 of which we are so very grateful that you've been a part. Thank you very much. Thank you.